Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, also known as SIADH. The hypothalamus is a region of the brain involved in coordinating the physiologic responses of different organs that together maintain homeostasis. The hypothalamus have neurons running towards the posterior pituitary, which produces neuropeptides and will release them into circulation. ADH, also known as arginine vasopressin, is one of the neuropeptides which are released into circulation. An increase in serum osmolarity, or a decrease in blood volume, will stimulate the hypothalamus to produce antidiuretic hormone, also known as ADH. ADH is produced by magnocellular neurons, which will carry and then release them from the posterior pituitary gland into systemic circulation. So what does ADH do? Well, ADH's main effect is to increase water reabsorption from the kidney. How do they do this? The kidneys are made up of their functional units called nephrons. And here is one nephron as an example. Afferent arterial will bl bring blood to the head of the nephron, forming what's known as the glomerulus. The glomerulus will filter blood through and into the nephron tubules. It enters the first part of the nephron called the proximal convoluted tubule. The proximal convoluted tubule have channels uh, on it called aquaporin 1 channels, which reabsorb water. The aquaporin 1 channels are responsible for reabsorbing 90% of water that is filtered through the nephron. The filtrate in the tubule remainder will continue along the tubule um, through the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting ducts. The remaining 10% of water is actually reabsorbed in the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule, and is primarily driven by the hormone ADH. ADH increases expression of aquaporin 2 channels which results in water reabsorption. Despite being responsible for only 10% of water reabsorption from the nephron, this goes a long way. Let's take a closer look at how ADH actually reabsorbs water. There are cells which line the collecting ducts called principal cells. Principal cells have all these aquaporin type 2 channels in this so this endosome, the cytosome, ready to be expressed by the cell membrane. ADH will travel by blood and travel to the nephron. ADH will bind onto ADH receptors on the basal surface, so the bottom part of the principal cells. And this will stimulate then the expression of aquaporin type 2 channels on the apical surface of the principal cells. These channels will increase the reabsorption of water from the nephron tubule. Water enters the cell. The water then gets reabsorbed into circulation. The increase in water reabsorption increases blood volume and also decreases serum osmolarity. SIADH is syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH, resulting in uh, a lot of ADH uh, in the blood, in the serum, and also increases the ADH activity. Causes of syndrome of inappropriate uh, antidiuretic hormone secretion include trauma to the brain or the pituitary area, central nervous system disorders or infections such as meningitis, as well as ectopic ADH production, such as from lung cancer or even non-neoplastic ADH, such as from respiratory infections. Regardless of the cause, the pathophysiology of SIADH begins with uncontrolled secretion of ADH. When this happens, you retain more water you increase blood volume, and you will decrease serum osmolarity. Hypoosmolarity or hypoosmolality is usually a result of di dilution and secretion of sodium from the body. What contributes to water retention 
is also if you drink more in response to a decrease in blood volume or an increase in serum osmolarity. Now, this syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion you know, continues and you get an increase in blood volume for a while. And after a while, you will actually cause stretching of the heart muscle walls uh, in the atrium and in the ventricles. And when this happens, the heart produces natriuretic peptides, uh, ANP and BNP, um, as a response. Now, ANP and BNP inhibits renin release and activity through a few mechanisms. Regardless, the end result is a decrease in activity of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And because of this, you decrease angiotensin 2 function and also aldosterone function. A reduction in aldosterone and an increase in ANP and BMP, the natriuretic peptides, will promote naturesis. Naturesis is the excretion of sodium in the urine. Naturesis results in a decrease in blood volume and also a decrease in serum osmolarity. A decrease in blood volume means it will stimulate ADH release and promote its activity again, which is already present in SIADH. With so much SIADH, remember, there will be an increase in blood volume which really means that you are increasing the GFR, the amount of blood going into the kidneys. And as a response, this will also cause a decrease in renin production. Decrease in renin means you have decrease in the renin angiotestin aldosterone system, which means that you will essentially promote naturesis, the excretion of sodium from the body, and with that, water will follow. When you measure urine in people with SIADH, there will be high amounts of sodium in urine. The urine tends to be concentrated. And when you measure someone's blood, there will be low levels of sodium, termed hyponatremia. This cycle continues, with more blood volume and decrease in serum osmolarity over time, through an unknown mechanisms, the kidneys will eventually adapt. When the kidneys begin adapting, they will try to do something interesting. The number of aquaporin channels decrease at the apical surface of principal cells in order essentially to negate the increased amounts of ADH present. This means that the kidneys will learn not to reabsorb water. And so you will have diuresis and naturesis, peeing out water as well as sodium. And this will occur even if you consume salt and even if you ingest water. The urine in SIADH does not necessarily have to be concentrated. And this is one of the reasons why in patients with SIADH, the new steady state is a euvolemic state, not fluid overloaded, but also not dehydrated, thanks to the mechanism we discussed just before. Remember, SIADH is characterized by hyponaturemia, an increase in urine sodium excretion, and euvolemia. Also remember, clinically, patients with SIADH are euvolemic despite retaining water. The reason being, the body learns to excrete water eventually, maintaining this euvolemic state. The important clinical symptoms and signs of SIADH are related to the low sodium levels in the blood. Now, low sodium levels can be acute or chronic. Acute is defined by hyponatremia occurring less than 48 hours. Severe hyponatremia is defined as serum sodium of about 120 millimoles per liter or less. And this is usually when the symptoms of hyponatremia come up. Acute hyponatremia is dangerous because it can cause cerebral edema, neurogenic pulmonary edema, seizures, and even coma. The mechanism of edema in acute hyponatremia can be explained here. Let's look at cerebral edema, the dangerous complication of acute hyponatremia. You can imagine here is the brain and its neuron, and here is the circulation. In the circulation, you have water and low sodium levels. In the brain, you have adequate electrolyte levels, including sodium and potassium. 
Now, if you have suddenly low sodium in circulation, according to the osmotic gradient principle, water will move to the area with more solutes and so will develop edema rapidly. In chronic hyponatremia, you don't get cerebral edema because of cerebral adaptation. This is where, because of time, electrolytes from the brain are able to distribute, equalizing the electrolytes in circulation and in the brain. And so sodium and potassium, for example, can move into circulation, and this allows water to equalize more safely. Chronic hyponatremia is characterized by non-specific signs and symptoms such as headache, nausea, vomiting, and seizures. The other signs and symptoms of SIADH will depend on the cause of the SIADH. Causes of SIADH include trauma, surgery, CNS infections, and stroke which affect the hypothalamic pituitary axis, increasing the production of ADH. Medications also somehow increase production or the effect of ADH. These medications can be remembered with the acronym CARDISH, chemotherapy, antidepressants, recreational drugs, diuretics, inhibitors such as ACE inhibitors and uh, SSRIs, sulfonylurea, and H is for hormones such as desmopressin. Another cause for SIADH are the malignancies, which cause ectopic production of ADH. Common examples include small cell carcinoma of the lung and pancreatic cancer. Pulmonary disease such as pneumonia can increase ADH production somehow. And there are nephrogenic causes, mainly the mutation in the aquaporin type 2 channels in the distal collecting ducts, which will increase the retention of water. Nephrogenic SIADH is aquaporin-2 mutation, which causes aquaporin-2 to remain open, resulting in water retention. Diagnosing SIADH requires a set criteria and ruling out other causes of hyponatremia. So let's look at some criteria to diagnose SIADH. One, you need to have hyponatremia with a normal extracellular fluid state, so a euvolemic state. Two, urine osmolality needs to be higher than plasma osmolality. The urine sodium needs to be greater than 20 millimoles per liter. And you need to rule out other causes of hyponatremia. This includes making sure the patient is not on diuretics. Pa patients have to have normal function of kidneys, thyroid, and adrenal glands, namely the production of cortisol. Management of SIADH is relatively similar. First, treat symptomatic acute hyponatremia quickly, as this can be life-threatening. Treat chronic hyponatremia slowly. The reason for this is to prevent what's called central pontin myelinosis, which we will talk about later. It's important to treat the main cause that could be leading to the low sodium and SIADH. Number two. Restrict fluid intake. 500 mils to 1 liter a day is good. This will lead to a reduction in blood volume, an increase in aldosterone, and so will hopefully increase sodium retention. Number three, administration of hypertonic saline if patients are symptomatic in any way. This has to be given slowly. Hypertonic saline has sodium in it. The fluid will also increase plasma volume. Fruzomide can also be given with patients who have features of mild fluid overload. Fruzomide works at the ascending loop of Henle, inhibiting a triporter. Fruzomide causes an increase in water, sodium, chloride, and potassium excretion. It's important to consider to replace the potassium chloride that's being excreted, and you can give potassium chloride in the hypertonic saline solution. Finally, Demeclocycline can be given. Demeclocycline is mainly used in chronic hyponatremia. Demeclocycline inhibits the renal action of antidiuretic hormone by in, in, inhibiting its binding onto the ADH receptors. 
Finally, rapid correction of hyponatremia can lead to central pontin myelinosis, which leads me to the complications of rapid correction of hyponatremia. So imagine you are using medications, fluids, to increase serum sodium rapidly. This means you suddenly get all the sodium in circulation. Remember, water follows sodium. So what you get is water from the brain, for example, escaping into circulation because of the osmotic gradient. This causes shriveling and shrinkage, you can say, of the brain parenchyma. It is termed central pontin uh, myelinosis because when first described, it was found in the pons, and what was seen was damage to the myelin sheath. Central pontin myelinosis is characterized by a progressive development of spastic quadriplegia, pseudobulbar palsy, and emotional liability.